My name is Donna Livingstone. I'm the CEO of the White Museum of the Canadian Rockies. I'm very pleased to welcome you today. This is a really important discussion. If you've been listening to the news at all in the COP talks, this is really on a high priority. And if you want, if you, you're not going to get enough information here, and you will, but if you want more, stop by our shop because we've got some amazing books and really useful information. The land acknowledgement we usually give has special meaning as, we, as background for today's conversation. Indigenous peoples have lived, worked, met, and traded in this beautiful landscape for thousands of years. They have witnessed the changes to the landscape, to the water, to the ice, to the animals, and to the vegetation. At this time, we're very grateful for their guidance and wisdom as we all seek to care for this precious land. You may have noticed that over the past year or so, the White Museum wants to connect people with nature. We want them to, through art and history and stories and meaningful experiences. It's not hard, it's what we do, as it turns out. It's really in our DNA. Every painting, every hiking pole, every photograph and mountain diary speaks to the passion that visitors have had about coming to this land for, a thousand, for hundreds of years. Today's exhibitions, Cold Regions Warming and Contemporary Consciousness which, Consciousness, which is at the end of the hall, are good examples of opening up this conversation. We are delighted to have such a distinguished and passionate group of panelists to speak to us today, and we look forward to hearing from them shortly. But first, I would like to welcome the distinguished and passionate <laughs> Mayor of Banff, Her Worship, Corey DeMano. Awesome. So it's so wonderful to see you all here today. I had the privilege of exploring the show on opening night. And as you can see, it's just a fabulous show, show. And I look forward to listening to the insights and challenges from the scientific and stewardship perspectives this afternoon. As most of you, I see a lot of beauty in this show, as well as sorrow and gratitude and crisis. The works provoke feelings similar to those I sometimes experience hiking in the backcountry. I come home gripped with this sense of urgency to see more while I can. If you see glacier receding in your lifetime or can't see the mountains due to smoke in the summertime, you know climate change is happening around you. If you see rising tides and more frequent storms, you are acutely aware of the impacts of climate change. But for so many, it takes the insights of visual art and challenging discussions like this one today to elevate the beauty so worthy of our stewardship and the sense of action needed to support this vitality for future generations. And it's something we take very seriously in Banff. As you know, we're in Canada's first national park and a UNESCO World Heritage Site. So we have an enormous sense of privilege and a sense of responsibility to protect this special place. And if you live here, show of hands, who lives in the Bow Valley? So you folks know firsthand that the effects of climate change are already apparent here. There are observable changes in temperature, precipitation, and extreme weather events over the last century. For instance, the average annual temperature in the Bow Valley has increased by about 1.4 Celsius since the early 1900s. Winter months experience greater warming than summer months. Summers are getting longer. Over the same period, the amount and timing of precipitation in the area has also changed. Earlier, I mentioned smoke. Canada is recording more wildfires. I always say wildflowers. <laughs> Those are nice too, <laughs> but wildfires. And we see our local risk rising. We obviously saw it in summer this Jasper, this summer in Jasper, and that was something that certainly kept me awake at night, which is why the town of Banff prioritizes preparing for wildfire, and our local and regional experts help us evaluate this real danger in Banff. Projections of warmer and drier climate in the Bow Valley corridor by the 2050s will create conditions more favorable for wildfires. Warmer temperatures create longer forest fire seasons starting earlier, and as experienced this year, the season can extend well into October, or indeed all year round. Potential fuel for wildfire, deadfall, trees, brush, grasses are drying out sooner and staying dry later. More hot and dry weather also is expected to create more extreme weather, which includes lightning. 
So with drier fuel and more chances to ignite, we have more opportunities for wildfire that are more difficult to control. They can be dramatic and destroy property in urban areas. We've also seen how this has impacted tourism. So in 2003 and 2006 with local fire events, as well as in 2016 and 2018 with smoke blowing in from BC, we saw that folks chose not to come visit because of the fear that comes with you know, seeing an imminent fire nearby. The Bow Valley has also witnessed both flooding and drought, which are of course long-term climate impacts. We have seen severe storms, and although the recent years have been good, we expect warmer winters with less snow and shorter ski seasons. And of course, the town of Banff is always watching our aquifers and the potential for strain on our water resources. Okay, so now that the doom and gloom part is out of the way, I am so proud of the town of Banff's strong action plan to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Climate action is one of our strategic priorities in our strategic plan, and I believe it should be for every municipality on the planet. And we're also gonna be working through our renewable energy transition roadmap. That's basically our climate action change plan here in Banff. Some of our goals include reducing 30% of our greenhouse gas emissions by 2030 and 80% by 2050 as well as cutting waste going to landfill by 70% by 2028 and zero waste going to landfill by 2050. So we need experts like those here today to scrutinize our plans to assess if we're moving fast enough, if we're going far enough, and if we are doing the most impactful mitigations as individuals and as governments. I believe the right action can inspire other people, other municipalities, other countries to listen, learn, and act. And I really want that widespread action, which helps to remove that phrase from my mind, from your minds, when we see the beauty of a mountain glacier or a tidal pool, the desperation to see more while we still can. So I'm excited to be learning from our visiting artists and scientists and others in the room. And I am so pleased we are on this journey of examination and environmental protection together. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Corey, and thanks for all you do and your, and your uh, team for the vision that you're bringing to us, because we need it badly. One of the side effects of this, um, this project and, and the collaboration is that we've um, met some whole new colleagues, and we were developing very good friendships. I'd now like to introduce Anna Burton, who's the Director of Development for Institutional Research at the University of Sask Saskatchewan, and she's been helping us in, with her team in this exhibition. Anna? Thank you so much. It's, um, it's my deep honor to be here to bring remarks on behalf of the University of Saskatchewan and our <laughs> Chancellor, Grit McCreeth. Um, Chancellor McCreeth is no stranger to the White Museum, having sat on the board here for about 10 years. And we're very grateful for, to her for having stewarded a really wonderful relationship between the University of Saskatchewan and the White Museum of the Canadian Rockies. In my role, it's my great privilege to be able to fundraise for our research institutions at the University of Saskatchewan. And one of those is our Global Institute for Water Security, which also boasts our Global Water Futures Program. The Global Institute for Water Security at the University of Saskatchewan makes us the Canada's top ranked water research institution and also one of the best in the entire world. A big reason for our success is thanks to the work that Dr. Pomeroy and his team do right here in the Canadian Rockies. We have a cold water laboratory just down the road in Canmore, and it is home to some of the very best mountain, snow, ice, and glacier researchers in the whole world. It's also home to our Global Water Futures program that I mentioned a little bit earlier. It's the world's largest university-led freshwater research program. So there's a lot of really great impactful data coming out of the University of Saskatchewan right now. The high mountains, like the ones that you see around us here in the Bow Valley, are often referred to as the water towers of the world. It's the Rocky Mountains that are the headwaters of the river system for almost all of the western part of North America. And because of global warming, they're even more susceptible to this change. So how do we talk about climate change? How do we communicate the urgency and the importance of what's happening here? How do we empower the decision makers, politicians, and the citizens of the world, you and I, to make a difference? Well, one of these ways that we can have this conversation is through art. The Cold, Water, or Cold Regions Warming Exhibit is a collaboration between art and science, and it's a chance for us to witness the fragility, the urgency, 
and also the great beauty that we see through this change happening on our planet. So I'd like to sincerely thank um, the White Museum for hosting such an impactful exhibition and also express my deep gratitude to artists Gennady Ivanov and researchers Dr. John Pomeroy, and Dr. Bob Sanford for the conversation that we'll have today. Thank you, thank you, Anna. It's now my pleasure to introduce our visionary, resourceful, and thoughtful head curator at the White, Anne Ewan. She's the one who makes sense of all of these exhibitions. I've got to say, to be honest, when the stuff came in, it was kind of lying all over the floor, and I wasn't sure what it was going to do, but Anne and her team brought it together beautifully, placed it in a way that makes sense to us, lit it wonderfully, and made connections that we might otherwise have made. So I want to thank her. So please join me in welcoming Anne Ewan, who will be our moderator today. Um, I'm going to be asking the panelists uh, three questions each, and they're going to respond within two to three minutes. And then at the end of their discussions, we encourage the audience to ask them questions as well. To begin, um, most museum missions statements include words like education and research. And here at the White Museum, we like to think that we do that well. But in a time of scientific consensus on climate change and during this really critical period where global acceptance and action is necessary, we, like other cultural institutions, realize we need to up our game. And so we are. Additionally, we're acutely aware that the future of humanity depends upon our ability to reconnect with nature and to live sustainably and within our means. Therefore, through our collections and programs, the White Museum is bridging the gap between nature and people, and in doing so, we are trying to reacquaint the complicated characteristics of our environment by hosting events such as this panel discussion and exhibitions such as Cold Regions Warming and Contemporary Consciousness. Additionally, we continually reach out to the Indigenous communities of the region whose historic and contemporary presence bring relevance to our collections, exhibitions, stories, and programs. Cold Regions Warming is an interdisciplinary collaboration between artist Gennady Ivanov, I got that right, and Global Water Futures scientist Professor John Pomeroy and Trevor Davies. Paintings, drawings, and videos depict locations in Canada where global warming was impacted or has impacted glaciers, oceans, lakes, and rivers. Global Waters Futures is headquartered at the University of Saskatchewan in Saskatoon and aims to demonstrate global leadership in water science in cold regions. From a scientific base, the group also addresses the needs of the national economy in adapting to change and managing the risks of uncertain water futures and extreme events. With the combination of science, fact, and art, this exhibition is designed to inform on various levels of appreciation. So approximately four years ago, I met with Professor uh, Trevor Davis, who unfortunately is not with us today, and Professor John Pomeroy, as well as artist Gennady, at the Coldwater Laboratory in Canmore to discuss the possibility of an exhibition. This meeting was made possible through the introductions by Bob Sanford, and Grip McCreeth, who is the Chancellor of the University of Saskatchewan and a past White Museum board member. But a few years before this meeting, it was Gennady's growing awareness of the climate impact on the changing Norfolk coastline that ultimately led him to Professor Davis. Trevor then introduced Gennady to his friend and colleague John Pomeroy, and between their three ventures, the interdisciplinary collaboration traditions was born. Needless to say, we, are immediately we were immediately enthusiastic about working with the transitions team and our continued discussions have culminated in this exhibition and um, associated programs. So to introduce you to our wonderful panelist, first I'd like to introduce Dr. John Pomeroy, who is the director of the Global Water Futures Program, the largest university-led freshwater research project in the world. At the University, uh, university of Saskatchewan, he is the Canadian Research Chair in Water Resources and Climate Change and Distinguished Professor of Geography. 
He's also director of the Center for Hydrology and director of the Cold Water Laboratory, Canmore. He's a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, the American Geologic, sorry, Geophysical Union and the Royal Geological Society, and is the 2019 recipient of the Miroslaw Romanovsky Medal from the Royal Society of Canada. And um, he leads the International uh, Network for Alpine Research Catman Catchment Hydrology Project of the World Climate Research Program. His primary research um, interests are in cold regions hydrology and water quality with an emphasis on snow redistribution ablation processes and the development of novel observational and modeling techniques. He has authored over 300 research articles and several books that have been cited over 17,000 times. And most recently, he and his colleagues from the University of Saskatchewan, the University of Calgary, Chile and Naples have had a UNESCO chair in water sustainability approved. It will be headquartered in Canmore. Great news. If I've left anything out, John, you can jump in it whenever. Okay. <coughs> Their bios are just like a mile long. We'd be here till midnight if I had to say everything about each and every one of these people. At the end of the table is um, Robert Sanford. I'm so, many of you know him. He's based in Canmore. And he's a leading thinker on water issues in, Can in Canada. He is the director of Western Watersheds Research Collaborative and an associate of the Center for Hydrology at the University of Saskatchewan. He is also a member of the Forum for Leadership on Water, a national research group based in Toronto, as well as EPCOR chair of the Canadian Partnership Initiative under the United Nations Water for Life decade. He holds the Global Water Futures Chair in Water and Climate Security at the United Nations University Institute for Water, Environment and Health. Sanford also serves as an advisor on water issues to the Interaction Council, a global public policy think tank composed of more than 20 former heads of state. He's written numerous books on water issues in Canada, including his latest book, Cold, Waters, sorry, Cold Matters, The State and Fate of Canada's Fresh Water, which was published in uh, 2012. His book, Vanishing Glaciers, won the Lane Anderson Prize for the best science writing in Canada in 2017. And our bookshop carries a ton of his books. They're all there, or most of them, so do have a gander. Last but definitely not least, um, our panel is, um, our one panelist is Gennady, uh, Gennady Ivanov. Gennady was born in Russia, and he's originally from Belarus, but he's now a renowned UK-based artist with more than 40 years of experience. He graduated with a Master's of Fine Art from Norwich University, and since 2019, he's been involved in several large projects and exhibitions across the UK, and is currently an artist in residence at the University of Saskatchewan. Gennady was the winner of the Norfolk Arts Awards, the Visual Arts Award in 2021. His work addresses the acts of looking and seeing and considering the way in which painting can stake a claim for itself amid the proliferation of contemporary visual formats. This allows him to work simultaneous in several different directions in style. And indeed, it's possible to trace his focus on the whims of memory, history, and subculture style to his parallel life as a poet, fiction writer, and historian. His paintings demand a, specta a spectator's intelligence, their visual and emotional effort. Um, the combat, uh, sorry, his work is widely, uh, is a wide variety of media, including paintings, installations, drawings, and photography. And he brings these media together in a provocative collision. Kennedy's work mines a territory defined not only by the specter of recent world political history, but also the deeply flowing social veins of underground styles as manifested in the popular cultural realm of street art, fashion, and experimental dance and music. So let's all welcome these three wonderful, incredible people. Okay. Um, starting with first question. The first question I will address um, to, oh, you know what, I forgot to mention, I wanted to just say something briefly about um, Trevor Davies, who can't be here, but he is instrumental in all of this happening. Um, he is uh, um, 
Professor Emeritus, uh, University, or sorry, School of Environmental Science. He's a member of the Chip Tidal Center for Climate Change Re Research and a member of the Center for Ocean and Atmospheric Cent of Sciences and a member of the Climate Research Unit. He is also very involved in this transitions project. Wonderful person. Okay, first question. John, are you ready? Yes. Okay. What are the changes happening to, cl to climate, snow, glaciers, and water in the Canadian Rockies, and how does this relate to global climate change? Okay, uh, thank you for the question. So, three minutes, right? Yeah. Um, okay. Trevor the, said I was allowed to you. Uh, you, you might have to. Uh, no, it's a, a course. Uh, I, could, I could give a university course on this and fill it over a whole term, but I'm not going to do that to you. Um, but there have been profound changes in the Canadian uh, Rockies over the last uh, few decades associated with uh, what's called anthropogenic climate change or climate change that has been forced by greenhouse gas emissions that humanity has had something to do with. And the, uh, because warming is a big part of this change in the climate, uh, then things that are frozen are impacted by this. And we can see this in the Rockies because uh, uh, it's warmer in the valley bottoms, colder up top, so you can see snow lines that tend to rise higher or faster snow melt rates uh, that have occurred. If you uh, go to the Kananaskis Valley, for instance, the snowpacks in the valley bottom are one half of the depth they were in the 1960s. And so that's where you can see some very profound changes over time. The, uh, but we're also seeing this, of course, in the glaciers. Um, glaciers that have been monitored uh, for the longest period in the Rockies, and Pito Glacier in northern part of Banff National Park is one of them, has, has retreated almost three kilometers uh, since the 1950s. Uh, we've seen rapid retreat in, in uh, very recent times. Uh, over the last two decades, retreating about 25 meters a year, that jumped up to over 200 meters in after the hot summer of 2021, and a total of 330 meters from uh, 2019 up until this year. And they're melting downwards as well, uh, about five to six meters per year downward wasting of the ice as it melts. Um, lots of other changes happening. The forest fires have covered our glaciers with soot. As a result, they become colonized by algae that has further darkened them and accelerated the melt rates. Uh, we've, uh, we've experienced in the last decade here in the region uh, the most extreme floods of our lifetimes, but also some of the lowest stream flows of our lifetimes. And we're seeing these things now in sequence uh, back and forth. We can flip from a drought year to a flood year at a uh, snap of a finger. In fact, 2013, which people in this valley will probably never forget, would have been a drought year except for three days of heavy precipitation that occurred in late June. The rest of the year was actually rather dry. So that's how quickly things flip. Um, uh, basically, we were in drought on entering drought on June 18th, and by June 20th, we had massive destruction due to flooding. So the, um, the next steps are wildfires. Uh, the spread of wildfires, particularly in Jasper, uh, has been absolutely profound and has changed the face of the national parks. We'll see more of that, unfortunately. Um, we're also seeing changes to our stream flow and ability to supply uh, drinking water, irrigation water, hydroelectric water, and ecosystem water to the rivers that flow to the east through the Saskatchewan system, to the west through the Columbia system, uh, and through the Fraser system, and to the north through the Athabasca and Peace River systems. So the, um, remember, we are the hydrological apex of North America where water flows in all directions to three different oceans, and what happens here doesn't stay here. It affects uh, the vast areas of the continent. So um, lots has been going on. We've been monitoring this through a network of uh, hydrological and weather stations that we call the Canadian Rockies Hydrological Observatory. And it's about 35 stations spread from Jasper Park down into Kananaskis, generally at locations where you wouldn't normally see a weather station or a stream gauge or a snowpack measurement. If you go up to Bow Hut, you might see one up there. If you go up on, uh, onto the ridges uh, behind Nikiska Ski Area, Centennial Ridge, you might see one there. If you wander up on some of the glaciers, Pato or Athabasca, you might see some there. And that's how we track this, along with lots of students, postdocs, and other researchers who are based in Canberra to help us do it. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thanks, John. Uh, Bob, 
what concerns you with respect to climate change? <clears throat> I'm going to go at this uh, more from a policy point of view from the UN. And as we predicted decades ago, we as a society have arrived in the domain of multiple simultaneous existential threats, or what we have come to call poly risks. And more than that, we now find ourselves in a state of permanent poly crisis, and our current poly crisis appears to be unstoppable. Climate change now has become a threat multiplier of all other mutually reinforcing elements of the perma crisis. And though we don't see it yet here, as we might, uh, here in Canada, we are an epicenter of exactly that crisis. And it's difficult to have hope when you are trapped in a global environmental Ponzi scheme. As you know, a Ponzi scheme is a con in which investors are paid not with profits from successful investments or production of successful products, but with money from a steady stream of new investors. And we as a society have been drawing down the ecological capital of the planet for generations. And we've taken so much from the earth that we've reduced the options of future generations. And in a world in which we're paying off one generation by drawing down the assets of the next, we have to really have a serious question about what kind of hope makes sense. And it's hard to have hope when you live among eight billion others whose lives have been organized around keeping this kind of Ponzi scheme going. And we know that Ponzi schemes only end up one way, with some people paying for the illusion of endless growth and eternally high returns. Now, if there is a path forward, and I'm here to say that there most certainly is a positive path forward, it requires us to face our worst fears of the future and to speak of them freely. And this is especially true of those of us who consider ourselves writers. We live in what really are essentially apocalyptic times, but it's important to see these times in context. Apocalypse from the Greek meant a lifting of the veil. Uh, a disclosure of what is hidden to most, uh, a coming to collective clarity, and it's that clarity that we must seek now. Apocalypse in this context is not about rapture, it's about rupture, rupture severe enough to change the nature of human existence, and is important in working our way in the direction of a post-apocalyptic future to recognize that we will not solve this problem by pointing fingers at one another. We're all implicated in what has happened and we're all in this together. But whatever ground on which we may personally stand, we cannot accept anything but the truth. In these apocalyptic times, anything that blocks us from looking honestly at reality no matter how harsh that reality might be, must be rejected. And as 1950s playwright and novelist James Baldwin famously noted, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it's faced. Baldwin urged writers of his time to tell as much truth as one can bear and then a little more. In the time in which we live, writers are being urged to tell as much truth as one can bear, then a little more, than all of the truth, whether one can bear it or not. And I agree with that. We're going through the narrows of the human journey. The future we face presently is trending towards societal collapse, at least rolling societal collapse. So I'm not a collapsologist, and I, I'm certainly not a collapse -a not one of those people already digging in in preparation for a post-apocalyptic world. Nor do I consider myself a pessimist. I'm trying to be a realist who still has hope, and it is in facing our problems squarely, truthfully, and relying on science to guide our way to the truth is where hope resides for me. Thank you. Uh, so Gennady, um <laughs> Gennady, how has uh, working with scientists changed the way you paint and the way you see? Um, yeah, thank you for the question, yes. Um, um, it's definitely uh, changed because, yeah, most of drawings, what you can see around, um, have been made on a, on a field. Um, so the main, the main idea and, and um, 
was to go on the field and to see the place and pro problems and um, to draw it. So what we what we done? It's I I remember we've been traveling quite a lot with Trevor and John, um, for example, like Yukon, Northwest Territories, um, Jasper, Alberta, and um, during this time, John and Trevor always been chatting and talking to me about the uh, problem um, particular place and the region, the fires, um, melting glacier, um, permafrost turbine, and, um, and they've been showing to me these places and um, I've been taking photographs and, um, and tried to make very quick sketches. So this is very different from what I've been doing and, I, and I'm doing sometimes, plain air paintings and drawings on the field. So when you go and just relax and see the beauty of nature, but this place is, you see the beauty, but also you, it's a, lots of hidden um, problems and um, disasters and um, you need to think totally different, a different way. Um, it makes you sometimes very sad and um, it's, it's, it's given you to, to me quite difficult feelings like sadness, uh, same time aggressive and, um, and um, horror and uh, you don't know what will be in the future and I tried to show this. So it's definitely gave me a um, possibility to see and feel very different. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Gennady. John, um, how are you and your colleagues um, working to better measures, understand and predict these climate changes? Uh, thank you. As I mentioned, uh, part of it is the large measurement program that we have that is part of the Global Water Futures Observatories and the uh, hundreds of, of students and technicians and scientists working here and across Canada uh, to try to uh, better measure what's happening, to also build uh, improved computer forecast models so that we can better predict floods, droughts, but also how much water, how much snow and ice will we have in 20 years, in 50 years, in 100 years? What will the quality of our water be? Uh, what other surprises are coming in store? Will we be able to predict forest fires more accurately? Things like this. But also then working around the world uh, with scientists in Europe, in the Alps, in the Pyrenees, in uh, Scotland, in the Andes, in the Himalayas, and uh, the Caucasus, elsewhere, uh, even in Africa, in the Atlas Mountains, on the similar problems that mountain regions are facing ar around the world. I had the opportunity to speak uh, to the COP27 conference this week by Zoom um, uh, twice. Uh, one was a session uh, devoted to concerns about mountain glaciers, and so something that we proposed and is an international year for glacier preservation and for 2025, and this seems to have growing support amongst countries and will be voted upon at the UN General Assembly this winter. The, um, the other session was dealing with the North, and uh, Iceland uh, sponsored this, and, and looking at the, uh, the rapidly warming parts of northern Canada, the thawing permafrost, uh, the increased flooding, the fires, uh, the uh, shrubification of the Arctic and other things. So it's a cooperative approach to this very much. We try to uh, work with some of the best people, some of the best minds around the world on these problems because we need to. And, the, um, and we're hoping that governments like the Government of Canada and others will start to increase their capacity to take on things like forecasting and prediction programs to help communities adapt and prepare for the extreme events that are, uh, that are happening now and the ones that are to come. So thank you. Thank you very much, John. Um, Bob, uh, what does art matter in context of understanding the climate disruption to the story? Please uh, allow me to begin answering that question by saying that I just don't think 
there has ever been a more important time to hold an exhibition like this and a panel like this. And I really congratulate the White Museum for their wisdom and foresight doing this. Never before has how science tells its stories been more important. The story humanity has been telling itself about itself over the past 200 years has proven to be dangerous to our future. Science has the power to change the path of that narrative and alter the next chapter of humanity's story so that it's not the final chapter. Even though many are rushing back to be part of it as the pandemic temporarily winds down, the story we want to keep telling ourselves is not going to sustain us. What we clearly and most urgently need now, right now, is a fresh dream of who we are, one which tells us how to act, new stories about taking care of one another and what we have and drive us to appropriate action. And as part of this narrative, we also need to create a new sense of time that extends forward to include future generations. And right now, finding that story may be our most urgent collective action, but we need to hurry. We are witnessing a great bonfire of our heritage. Things are being lost that have not yet been found, and we need to find them before they and we are gone. We cannot do what we need to do and what we want by ourselves, nor in this urgent moment can science on its own give us all we need. Now, fortunately for humanity, science has a sibling. Science is older sister is art, and since the dawn of time, art has been a mirror of the mind's journey toward truth, a mirror that illuminates the way for others to follow. Now more than ever, with the planet in peril, we need the power of art and its truth to inspire and guide us. The public trusts artists with the truth because we know that artists not only make ritual, but actual lifestyle sacrifices to be worthy of their authenticity and the sincerity of their voice. And presently, those who devise the social and economic policies we're all asked to support and abide by encounter little or no art in their deliberations. And in my view, this is unenlightened, not to say counterproductive. It's an approach to addressing existential threats that is not adequate. Barry Lopez tells us that it was during the Enlightenment that art, as a distinct form of truth-telling, began to lose its dominant place in the human imagination to, to science, and uh, the scientific revolution was objectively proving what it was proving about the nature of the world. But now we peer on the cusp of another kind of orientation, a resituating of art once more in a position of considerable perceptual authority. And there's no time to waste. We need other forms of consciousness to give us the story that we need. And that is why we so urgently need art. It is essential now, as the prospect of planetary catastrophe comes ever closer, that we trust the intuition and listen to artists. The fate of humans and all our relatives depends on it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bob. Okay, Gennady, um, how did you produce such a wide range of art in such cold and remote places? And if you could explain your approach in the field and how that work differs from what you later produce in the studio. Oh, thank you very much. Um, the, the pastel drawings, for example, are made, yes, on a very difficult uh, uh, places like um, um, ice fields and glaciers on frozen rivers and lakes and um, so for me it's very important to as I said previously we discussing a lot um, about places and problems um, in a car and talks um, different places um, so, um, the, my, so the the main for me picture I have a picture kind of in my mind and uh, when we arrive into the place, I'm uh, kind of ready for to see what I mean. I need to see what's important to see, and um, and it takes me, for example, like 
one, two minutes to take my pastels and uh, pastel paper. So I can paint, I can draw on, um, on a rock or on a, just on a, my knees, uh, or if it exists some bench or any places where I can sit or just on the grass. And um, so the, for me, it's most important to, to take not too many details of the place, just to give um, feelings and uh, momentum um, time of this place and the problems of this place. So it can go via color, via um, pastel paper color. It can be sometimes I'm taking different colors of paper and, um, and adding some um, details of, of and hints of different colors, like bright colors, which um, represent uh, problems. So it's give me, yeah, it's, and it, I draw like very quick, it's like 10, 15 minutes, um, even less sometimes. Um, yes, in the studio, I've got a big studio in Norwich. Um, it's totally different way I do. Um, most of canvases um, been prepared, um, they have a background like, um, different colors and um, so splashes of paint. Uh, sometimes I paint on um, um, my old paintings, is giving me texture. So um, if I have some, some ideas to do, I, can, I, I paint very quick, but it takes me one, two weeks to think what I should paint. Um, so when I have a full picture in my mind, so I, I can paint just in an hour, painting or two hours a day, sometimes. And uh, most of most of most of time, I don't add anything else after that because I quite like rawness and freshness, um, and which giving actually very strong feeling. Because if I start to add more details, it can kill the painting. Really. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, John, this one's for you. Um, has working with Gennady helped you to better see and communicate the impact of climate change in water? Yes, I think uh, working with artists um, has a tremendous power for scientists. Um, the uh, one is that art provides a record of, of more than the scene, but the whole dynamism. This is a reproduction of a piece of art hanging in a museum in Vienna, Austria, uh, by the original by Thomas Ender of the Pasteur's Glacier. It was painted in 1830. And I'll leave it up here so you can look at it afterwards. But if you look at this glacier, it looks quite different from all of our glaciers now. It's bulging, it's uh, thick, it's thicker than its valley, it's enormous. And in fact, the Pasteur's Glacier doesn't look like this anymore. It's lost over one half of its volume since 1851, and it's been retreating at about 10 meters per year over most of that time. So the um, lost much of its over eight and a half kilometer length. The uh, working with artists uh, such as Gennady, and in particular Gennady, who has a tr tremendous gift for absorbing information and synthesizing it, allows scientists to do things that we don't allow ourselves to do. We write our, pace, our papers and separate ourselves from the science as much as we can. We stay as dispassionate as possible in there, as cold-blooded as possible, um, basically uh, start with skepticism about everything and then see what can be proven, and that's part of the scientific method. Uh, which has its effectiveness. But when you're dealing with a crisis, such as we're dealing with right now, that has profound implications for humanity, for our survival, and for the survival of every living thing on this planet, that's not enough. And uh, we need to approach this as humans in the end. We need art to help us digest and feel in our hearts what those graphs that you might see on some posters here are, are going to be telling us. And. There's great examples in history of this. The uh, tremendous revival of art in the Renaissance in Italy in the 1400s and 1500s was also the revival and development of science, as Bob Sanford has said. 
And that's what we need now. We need that renaissance of art and science to help us come together to find solutions for this global crisis. And those solutions, whether they're local or others, can only come from the first, the recognition of what these changes mean, and that comes from our hearts as well as our heads. So uh, that's what I think this combination can do, and it can be transformative. And uh, my gosh, I hope it is. So, thank you. Um, Bob, this one's for you. Um, what gives you hope and allows you to carry on in this work? Well, I think all of us, uh, certainly I am, and I know John is, are often asked about how when we see and know what we know and we are measuring and monitoring it, how do people working in the climate science community remain hopeful? Well, the first thing that keeps me going is the sincerity, commitment, and integrity of the people I work with. And I'm convinced after this week with the world crossing the threshold of eight billion people and the near failure of COP27 in Egypt that some of the people that I work with by their very nature simply do not know how to give up. And I want to be among those people. But like many others, I have to admit that I have my ups and downs. But we all know that despair is a dead end, a cop-out, that if you have been lost to despair, you have become someone that cannot help, but instead needs help to carry on. And I have found also that hope is not something that someone can give you. Hope is something you have to earn. And that is what I call the hard work of hope. And that said, it's difficult sometimes not to feel helpless in the face of such rapid and accelerating change. I have found, however, that hope can be a reward you can get for patiently and persistently bearing witness. And I have found many revelations paying attention to the research outcomes and the wonderful things that we have learned about the hydrology and climate system of this planet from Global Water Futures. And I've also, by bearing witness, seen other remarkable changes in the way that we think. And part of this started with me with reading Suzanne Simard's Finding the Mother Tree. Uh, Canadian Suzanne Simard and other scientists around the world have offered peer-reviewed research outcomes that demonstrate that trees can possess in certain old growth situations sentience and forests can exhibit forms of intelligence over time frames until now imperceptible to humans. And if this is actually true of ancient forests, what of other ecosystems? What of oceans? And in its simplicity and power, the idea of protecting all our relatives may well be the key to creating bridges between peoples across the globe. The reemergence of this simple concept could mark the most important reset in human understanding of the planet upon which we live since the mechanistic worldview came into existence during the Renaissance 500 years ago. So in this context, what I think we need, what we urgently need now, is a second, new, and very different enlightenment. But no enlightenment can proceed without a renaissance. We all of us need to be part of that renaissance. We all of us need to be that new and wiser beginning, that next great story. A better world is possible. Let us create that world, and you can bet that I plan to go right to the end pressing for that renaissance, the renaissance that will create for our children and their children that better world. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Gennady, how have your feelings changed about the environment, the snow and the ice and the climate since your involvement with the Transitions Project team? Thank you very much. Um, yes, Transition Project was, um, this is one um, most exciting project for me. Um, many years ago, I started, well, I always used to go to um, Norfolk coast and UK. Um, and um, 15 years ago, I went to one of the quite famous beach is called Haysborough. And, um, and I have seen the, lots of um, uh, sea defenses um, 
new build, they spend lots of money, millions, and um, from wood and metal, very looking very strong, and um, and concrete barricades, everything. It was very interesting. I got, I still got some photographs, and. Um, Recently, two years ago, three years ago, sorry, four years ago, I just visited the same beach and um, I found everything was destroyed. And um, the houses, which just by the beach, have uh, been falling down. And, um, and there's a big disaster in Norfolk. Um, the sea ate um, the farmlands. The, the roads where I used to walk, it's disappeared, disappeared. The beach and coastline crumbling very fast. So I started asking myself questions, what's going on? And um, I started to paint it and different variations. And, uh, and after that, I show paintings to Trevor Davis, Professor Trevor Davis. And um, we start, I start to be interested more and more to find what's going on. And uh, I was quite, quite semi-denier of climate change because in UK is people not expecting very much different. Weather is quite stable, it used to be. Um, warm, in the winter quite warm, in the summer it's quite cool. So generally it's, it's not bad, but interesting this year Britain uh, had a record, it's plus four, it was plus 40 in the summer. Um, so, and, um, so because I'm from North country and um, I used to love the snow and uh, I, I quite like cold really. And um, for me, it's very important. When I was a kid, uh, I remember I used to live in Belarus and um, we used to play hockey and ice skating, but when I start to be mature and older, I, I don't remember I've been pay, playing and ice skating and nothing. I, it's the snow disappeared. It's only existed one, two weeks, and sometimes months, but not very long. And, um, and now even less, and um, always rain and such a miserable weather all the time. So it's for me, um, it's shocking how how big difference now. The, it's the scale of this problem and um, it's a vast and I, I can't believe in it. And really it's working, well, this work for me is very important. It's, main element of my life now because I can't live without it and uh, not to show this to people and to say something about it. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Thank you. All right, I'm going to uh, open it up to the floor. Um, are there questions that people would like to ask of the panelists? And if so, oh, okay. <coughs> do you want to come over here and talk in the mic or do you want to scream from there? Over there, Donna? Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, first of all, thanks to Donna Quake, uh, uh, University of Saskatchewan and Institute, and, uh, for holding this sort of event. It's, it's great to have a right brain, left brain uh, kind of afternoon. I think it's one of the initiatives. My question is uh, I suppose for Bob, which I might want to weigh in this too. And, in your first uh, first part of your uh, answer, uh, what I'd be talking about, uh, <clears throat> giving the people all the truth that can bear, maybe a little bit more. Uh, and yet, we frequently hear, including from some noted uh, climate scientists, uh, that people really can't bear the truth. If it's uh, if it's talking about near term human extinction. Uh, and it'll, it's such a turnoff, uh, people will give up hope and uh, we won't be moving in the direction that we want. Uh, I noticed uh, uh, leading up to uh, COP27, there seemed to be a difference in tone in a lot of the journalism that I was seeing. There was one notable piece in the New York Times by David Wallace Wells, who's 
quite uh, well-known uh, climate writer. And uh, he was saying, you know, a few years ago I wrote a book and uh, things looked pretty really grim. Well, I've gone out and talked to a lot of people and things still look pretty really grim. Uh, but maybe not as, as grim as we were thinking. We seem to have made some progress. I've since uh, referred to this as uh, what they call the bright side, which is to put a positive spin on things. And I'm just wondering if you have any comments on that whole question about truth and hope and so on. Okay, yeah. yeah. Well, first of all, that's Bart Robinson, and he's a member of a group called the Foreign Affairs Council in Canmore, who meets every second week, where they get seriously involved in issues of climate and, and the future of our civilization. So he is a person that's informed a lot of people about these matters, and I know I'm one of the grateful ones to have been benefited from this. And you know, uh, this uh, David Wells, uh, Wallace Walls uh, issue is, is quite important, because we're seeing, uh, for example, this past week, a news storyline emerging in the way that Bart has outlined it around COP27. And in the last couple of years, some climatologists have been reassuring the public that all of the storms, floods, droughts, and ice loss and temperature extremes are all worse and sooner than was predicted by the consensus science. The future of humanity might not be as bad as predicted. And we're being told uh, it's not so bad that it's already so bad. And uh, this new storyline is being picked up by the media and politicians hungry for any kind of good news with respect to the accelerating climate threat. I mean, who these days can, can, can blame them? The problem, however, uh, when we talk about truth is that um, the hope in this story is false hope. The, the new story that climate change is worse than we thought but won't be as bad as we thought, in my view, should be regarded as a form of, uh, of climate uh, bright siding. And uh, the hope this story encourages is that we can justify staying positive, we can't face it, and that we will be saved by the experts with their technology and capital while we remain, all of us, calm and obedient to what the status quo is. So don't worry, the global climate solidarity cavalry is coming and it's gonna save us. And uh, the problem posed by this kind of misplaced positivity is that it's founded on the questionable assumption after 27 COPs that signatories to the Paris Climate Accord will in fact soon meet their national carbon reductions targets. So. Anyone following the science can see how dangerous this story is to our future. Now, it's good to be positive. I understand that, but we also need to be truthful. There is no global climate solidarity. From a UN perspective, the world is virtually ungovernable, and there's no cavalry coming. They're not coming to rescue us. So when I speak and hear the mayor speak, it's at the community level where we have to work. We have to be willing to drop the sunny side of the street fantasies captured in phrases like, well, the impossible will take a little while, and necessity is the mother of invention, while at the same time refusing to slip into paralyzing despair. And we have to have the courage to ask uncomfortable and difficult questions. And we've started too late, but we have to start. Bright siding might make us feel more positive about our relationship to climate change, but given the facts, it can be misleading and it can even be a cop-out. Ultimately, you can't escape the truth. If you've been diagnosed with cancer, you can't wish that fact away any more than the world can bright side carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere or dream climate change out of our lives. Things will not be fine if we just persist harder in what we're doing already. Unless things change drastically and immediately, and new evidence comes that gives me reason to do so, I don't see myself going over to the bright side anytime soon. But, on the other hand, I refuse to give up hope. And I hope that is an answer to your question. Thank you, Bart, and thank you, Bob. Um, does anybody have a question? Over here, over, there's one in the back. I'm not hearing the question. Sorry. 
can you come, do you want to come up here and just use this quickly? Um, and, I, and maybe you could ask, uh, suggest who you're directing it to, Dr. Palmer. I think this is for Bob. So, <clears throat> pardon me. So with, um, with the greed that drives climate change to, to the level where we possibly, likely won't recover, what is our best solution now that we as individuals can do? I mean, yeah, I, this whole beautiful exposition is on water, and I look at the amount of water I waste each day, and it kind of drives me a bit crazy. But at the same time, it is rushing from us on the way down to the ocean. And once it hits the ocean, our ocean levels are rising. So, I mean, it's kind of a paradox that, you know, do you know what I'm saying? I think, I think you know the question. Thank you. Well, I'll answer that first briefly. And then I know that John and Gennady may have uh, uh, much to say about this. Uh, we've done a lot of work on where you can be, have the most effect. And uh, I'm thinking of the mayor's comments again. Uh, the climate is coming at us fast. And municipalities are already getting hammered with, uh, with uh, the worst come with each passing season. And to avoid disastrous consequences, immediate year-by-year -year targets in communities are absolutely essential. Because if we say that we're just going to put it off until 2030 or 2040, we'll never get there because the, what you have to do in those subsequent years is too great. So you have to achieve those targets uh, uh, on an, uh, an annual basis. And to achieve those targets, municipalities need all the citizen support they can possibly get to set and meet agreed upon targets. So in response to your question, if there was ever a time for fierce, relentless, informed citizenship and visionary leadership, it is now. So how do we elicit that kind of citizenship? We have to work on strengthening our increasingly divisive side, society and reforming and strengthening our democracy. And there's a lot of work to be done here. So I'll leave it to the other two. So that John, did you want to weigh in on this? Yes. The, um, so the carbon dioxide concentration of the atmosphere is past 420 parts per million. Um, the, uh, within some of the oldest lifetimes of people in the room, it was in the low 300s. So we're conducting this vast chemistry experiment in the atmosphere. However, um, the, uh, the promises that have been made at various international meetings uh, to uh, lower the emissions of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases have not been met. And it's, uh, it's wildly frustrating. We've, there's sort of no mathematical way to achieve uh, a warming of only 1.5 degrees Celsius. But 1.5 degrees Celsius is too late for Pado Glacier and probably too late for most of the glaciers you can see along the Icefields Parkway. So that's the decision our leaders have made upon our, on our behalf. Um, and in democracies, we can influence those uh, decisions, and we have to. Um, the, uh, uh, these, if uh, at COP1, an agreement had been made in the early 90s, uh, we would have had a relatively smooth, long, slow transition to get this under control. It wouldn't be in the news um, any more than ozone hole is now or acid rain is. But we didn't. We put it off. We kicked the can down the road repeatedly. And now it's come back, and it's hitting us in the head. And, uh, and we risk a massive economic disruption and social disruption, as well as the, uh, the extreme costs of doing this. And we've left it so late that we are now going to need to pay reparations, essentially, to countries like Pakistan and others that have suffered excessively. But also in Canada, we have to manage our water much more carefully to avoid uh, the massive uh, destructions that other countries are seeing and that we, in fact, risk ourselves. Gennady, did you want to comment? Um, yeah, um, I just want to add, um, I think it's one of the um, 
<clears throat> solution is uh, to educate people. So the programs like this, I, <clears throat> I think personally is quite successfully successfully done, and um, so we can um, um, let to ordinary people to understand what's going on because via visual art and uh, because visual art is for main people it's um, it's it's quite important um, feelings and uh, um, and the structure of the image what people can see and pe and what people can read in it um, so education and this kind of these programs, um, I think if it grow and more more will be done via uh, poetry, music, literature, um, well any type of art, it will be it give yeah more and more possibility to people to understand and uh, to go forward with these all things. Yeah. Bob, you want to? Yeah, say I just something? wanted because this question has really got me thinking here. Um, <laughs> Um, unfortunately, uh, support for endless growth and, and effective climate action have difficulty being in the same room at the same time. And uh, the tension between the two is, is absolutely glaring. I, I just look at Alberta and, uh, you know, how does a town like Okotoks, Alberta, for example, consider emissions reductions targets anything but aspirational when the town's plan is to more than triple its population to 60,000 in the coming decades? And you look at a place like Canmore, uh, and we could conceivably have 14,000 more people creating problems that not only make it difficult to meet emissions reductions targets, but will change the entire physical and social characteristics of the town. And uh, uh, these are nothing compared to challenges other municipalities face. I was talking to the uh, uh, climate security officer for the city of Toronto, and the population of Toronto is projected to double by 2041. And uh, fighting difficult, fighting development is difficult. Fighting the idea of endless growth is even harder. And when you look at Alberta, for example, we see it in tourism. Our past premier indicated that we're going to uh, massively increase the tourism to Alberta. And, and I look at the mayor and her council and uh, 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 the town staff, and you have some excellent town mm -hmm. staff here. Um, and, and, you, and you look at that and you go, well, how do, how do we do that? You know, uh, how, how do we manage to, when everyone's bringing their CO2 with them and depositing it here, and you're going to double the number of visitors. Well, you could bet they're not going uh, to Raymond, British Alberta. They're going to be coming here. And so these things pose real challenges, and which demands again what John was saying. We've got to get, we've got to get really serious about getting a grip on this, so that the communities that we live in are better, not just overwhelmed. Bob, are you um, on that stakeholder committee for the municipal tourism event that's happening? No, I'm not. I, I, I speak annually at the National Tourism Conference in Victoria on these matters, but um, tourism is only one domain uh, which we're working in. I don't tend to operate at the sectoral level, but anyway, I hope that answers your question. So I think we had another question in the front row here. <clears throat> Did you want to come and use the microphone? Um, I'm thinking that uh, another uh, science and art exhibition is necessary to get the entire look at water here because all of this is surface water and uh, addressing groundwater is, is significant. Uh, and it would be good to have the science and the art doing that, especially in this province, because the Peto Glacier uh, that I've seen uh, in that side of the room uh, goes into the North Saskatchewan, is that correct? And the North Saskatchewan uh, is the river that's uh, the first drinking water source for Rocky Mountain House, where I come from. And I see the enormous amount of hydraulic fracturing that's going on all around the West Country and in a great deal of all of Alberta. 
and that only not only draws massive amounts of water out of the North Saskatchewan for water licenses, but it also contaminates the groundwater, which is part of the whole problem here. And I, when I talk to people, I say, do you drink your water? A third of the water in this province is well water. And I am surprised that whether it's people in Stony Plain area on acreages or around Rocky or West Central Alberta or Nordegg, people say, no, we buy water because our water's changed. We can't use our well. And we found the same thing in our area. And so we have disposal wells in this province that pump hydraulically toxins from oil and gas into the ground, not knowing where they go, but of course, they will be impacting our wells and our groundwater. And we're not going to have any change globally if we don't change at the municipal, provincial, and federal level. Also, I see that gravel bed rivers are all over and they're beautiful and the Bow River is one. Yet we don't have any serious setbacks for building like you're facing here in Canmore or in the elbow area of Calgary or even in Rocky Mountain House. We get closer and closer and we're on the river. And you're probably familiar with Dr. Rick Hauer at University of Montana. He spent decades studying gravel bed rivers. And he has a great uh, drawing where he said, the river isn't here. The river is, is here all the way down. And yet we're building and building. So is it possible the University of Saskatchewan would ever expand their program to look at groundwater, to look at the contaminants that we're pumping under and expand or do part two of this uh, beautiful science and art project. Thank you. John, I think this is okay. to you. Uh, <laughs> uh, thank you, and uh, it's uh, extensive what you've raised. I'll try to answer quickly. One thing is that you are seeing groundwater here everywhere because all surface and groundwater is connected. Uh, when you look at the Bow River right now, it's 100% groundwater uh, that is flowing through that river. Uh, that is the only source of our river's flow in the wintertime up until that spring melt and the spring rains hit. Um, and we're seeing mostly groundwater from midsummer onwards. The, and the groundwater and surface water are intimately connected. As you mentioned, the alluvial aquifers that Canmore, Banff draw their water from are connected to the Bow River and others uh, in your communities as well. We have extensive groundwater research in the Global Water Futures Program, uh, specific groundwater projects, including in the Rocky Mountains here, including the areas around Calgary, um, and in uh, Saskatchewan and Southern Ontario and Northern Canada as permafrost thaws. One of the projects uh, does look at the cross-contamination between deeper and shallower groundwater associated with uh, oil and gas industry and uh, has mostly focused in Saskatchewan in that area, has not been able to cover the whole country. The, uh, we would like to do more and uh, groundwater research in Canada does need more. Unfortunately, the Global Water Futures Program starts to wrap up next year. Uh, there is no possibility of renewal from the Government of Canada in the program that it's in. So these are sort the sorts of things that we'll have to look for new resources to keep that research going. Because there are issues, as you have raised very well, and human water use in Western Canada, all through Canada, is mostly groundwater use. And that's the one we have to look after. Also, as these glaciers disappear, um, during the drought and dry periods, it'll be the mountain aquifers that are supplying our stream flow, and we know next to nothing about them. So yes, there's more to be done. We'd love to do it. We're trying to figure out how to do that. So, thank you. Great, and I think there was one question. This young lady has a question for you, John. Oh, thank you. So the question was, what was it like to meet Greta? 
Yeah, so it's, uh, well, it was cool, but partly because it was a blizzard on Athabasca Glacier in November, but, uh, um, but a very, very nice uh, person. So she um, uh, made contact uh, a few months before and said she wanted to see a glacier, and did I know any, and know any scientists who could do it, and I said, yeah, we'll take you up on a glacier. And then I said, you know, I think you should come in September, October. Well, ended up coming in November. It was part of her tour. So, um, so we walked up the Athabasca in a blowing snowstorm. And she was really, really tough and uh, really smart. She had read all kinds of scientific papers beforehand, basically memorized them from what I can see, had really good questions set up. And she wanted to see this and experience it and understand it because she was going to a, one of these COP meetings, the uh, COP. Um, uh, 25 uh, just after that in, in Spain, in Madrid, and she was going to speak to world leaders. And so it was great to take her onto the ice, to show her how much the Athabasca had receded, uh, to show her what was going on, to show her the ash and soot that were melting this. And uh, she appreciated it very much and a very, uh, seemed a very humble, very quiet, very smart, very brave person. And uh, I think the bravery uh, struck me more than anything else. So uh, someone who could take that message and stand down U.S. presidents and others when they needed it, um, we need more of that. So you should do it too. <laughs> so Thank I you. know that there are a few other people that want to ask questions, but we're really running out of time. So you feel free to come up and talk to the panelists after. Um, the one question that they wanted me to ask them um, was what do you want the audience to take away from today's event? So John, I'll start with you, and then Gennady, and then Bob. Things that you might take from today's event is that uh, the science is very clear, the images, the art are also very clear. They've come together here with this message of tremendous change in the Canadian Rockies due to global warming. Um, but also, uh, though I will not underestimate the scientific challenges of what we have, which are absolutely immense, um, I hope the beauty of this art also instills perhaps a bit of hope in you, because we have 8 billion people on this planet. We have 8 billion brains, 8 billion hearts to work on these immense problems that we have. So yes, we have the most difficult problems in human history, perhaps, but we also have the greatest capacity to solve these problems in human history. We definitely have to get our act together, and uh, I hope uh, that's the strong message, is that we're in serious trouble. We have to act now. We can act now, and we can solve much of this problem. And that window is still open. That path is still open to us. So thank you. Um, um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I hope people who, who came uh, today or other days can take with itself, with itself the image, um, your local um, beautiful landscape. It's, there's no doubt, it's incredible. But the, there's lots of issues and and you can read it in paintings, you can see it. And um, the landscape is screaming, crying, and asking for help. So I hope you can see it and take it today. Uh, I want uh, to, in conclusion, encourage everyone here today to find their own words and ways to express what they think about climate change and about our future, and to trust in and build community, your community, in the interest of that future. For it is at the local level, at the level at which all of us ultimately live and work, that we have the most power to affect change and to act most effectively in service of where and how we live and who we love now and in the future. A better world is possible, and I'm really glad for this young lady's question. To make that world possible, however, we need to harness the energy, clear-sighted intelligence and courage of our youth. They are our future. This is a transformational moment, not just for the Bow Valley, but for all of us, for all of humanity. 
let us seize that moment. Thank you. <laughs>